How can you tell if your body is breaking down your muscle? Now, on the surface, you'd think, okay, I go to the gym and I'm weaker. That's a great sign that you're losing muscle. But there are actual metabolic signs, and there's some things that you can be paying attention to. So we'll look directly at them. Protein and muscle is interesting because it can grow, it can shrink, it can break down. It's not like other tissue in the body. So with this, we have to understand how muscle can break down. You see, there are really a few things that influence muscle and how we preserve it. There's simple stimulation, activity, there's the metabolic component, and there's the hormonal component. And any one of these three things can be out of whack. Okay, so if you're not stimulating your muscle enough, then certainly you can lose muscle. If metabolism is out of whack, not getting enough protein, other metabolic issues, metabolic syndrome, this can influence how fast you break down muscle. And then of course there's the hormonal piece. So let's jump into what you might notice. One of the first things you might notice is an ammonia smell, particularly when you're working out. So you can smell it through your urine. Now, when we break down proteins, a lot of times they have, they have all kinds of different fates, right? They can contribute to glucose, they can do all kinds of things. One of the things that happens is it can go through transamination, and then it can go through oxidative deamination. Now, when this happens, ammonia is a byproduct. So a lot of times people will smell a little bit of ammonia when they're breaking a lot of muscle down. So typically this happens after someone's gone for a long run or something like that. But if you start smelling this all the time when you're working out, it might be a little bit of a cause for concern because it implies that maybe you're breaking down more protein tissue than you're taking in in terms of dietary protein, or worse, you've got something else going on that's breaking down a lot of muscle, in which case you might wanna get some lab work and check some stuff out. So if you're consistently smelling ammonia in your urine or your sweat, that is a very telltale sort of metabolic sign. The next thing you might notice is higher levels of blood sugar gradually over time. Okay. One rapid spike in blood sugar doesn't mean you're breaking down muscle. Okay, that's not how it works. What I'm referring to is muscle as a metabolic glucose sink. So we store glucose in our muscle, and the more muscle that we have, the more glucose we can soak up. So assuming that you're eating the same amount of food over a longer period of time, you're, you haven't really changed your diet a lot, but you start noticing your glucose is just getting higher and higher and higher, well, there could be a number of different metabolic things going on, but one thing that might be happening is you're losing muscle mass and you're having less of a glucose sink for this glucose to be collected in. Therefore, you're eating the same amount of food, same amount of carbohydrates, but rather than it going in your muscle, it's starting to spike your glucose more. There was a study that was published in Journal Obesity that found that in the highest amount of muscle mass in individuals, there was 45% more insulin sensitivity, regardless of fat tissue. So even if someone had adipose tissue on them, the more muscle mass they had, typically the more insulin sensitive they were. So regardless, if you have more muscle, you typically are more insulin sensitive. And if you start losing that muscle and you're overweight, you don't necessarily see yourself losing it because you have fat on your body, well, this could be something that tells you if you just simply test your glucose. And again, it's one of many things, but it's something to pay attention to. Now, another thing is insulin resistance itself can lead to muscle protein breakdown. So you kind of get yourself into a vicious cycle here because you have that entire ubiquitone proteasome proteolithic pathway. Now, what this means is that basically the cells are starved of fuel because they're not getting glucose in very well. So the body starts upregulating this PPP process that essentially is breaking down muscle. Now, it's a more complicated process than just that on the surface, but in essence, when you become insulin resistant, you can start breaking down more muscle, which contributes to more glucose levels, right? You end up having higher glucose, less muscle, and this just steamrolls and steamrolls into a bigger problem. And the only way to really get yourself out of that problem is to do more resistance training. Move the actual body, activate the muscle so it soaks up glucose independent of insulin and hope that you can try to put on some muscle and get yourself out of that situation. Another thing you wanna be paying attention to is, well, obviously your protein intake, okay? And having protein coming in that can spike insulin in the absence of glucose is a really good thing. So what I recommend people do that might be dealing with more insulin resistance type issues is have a little bit of a whey protein shake now and then. Have something like that, because that's going to be what's called insulinogenic. So it spikes insulin, which can actually drop your glucose a tiny bit, but more importantly, you're getting adequate protein in. 
So yes, eat your meat, eat your steak, eat your chicken, eat your eggs, get those things throughout the day, but have some collagen protein, have some whey protein, have things like this throughout the course of the day. I popped a link down below for Bomar Nutrition. They have recently gotten rid of all artificial colors and artificial flavors out of their products. So there's no Splenda, nothing like that all gonna be stevia or monk fruit sweetened. And I really, really like their whey protein. They have a strawberry milkshake flavor whey protein. They have a number of other ones. They have cookies and cream, a bunch of really delicious flavors. But if collagen is more your speed and you're just trying to get tasty collagen in, they have some delicious flavors there. They have a hazelnut one that tastes tremendous mixed with yogurt. So that link down below will get you a special price, get you a nice hefty discount off Bomar Nutrition's flavored collagen off their flavored protein coffee that they have, which is really awesome. You can literally just make coffee that has protein in it, which is tremendous. Or they have their traditional whey proteins. So all those are gonna be down below using that link. It's a great way to start your day with that protein coffee. Great way to kind of increase overall protein values throughout the course of the day, but doing it in a way that can help keep muscle protein breakdown at bay. Because at the end of the day, all that balance of muscle protein breakdown and muscle protein synthesis. How do we counteract the breakdown? We add more protein so we have more synthesis. It's a simple balance. Okay, but let's talk about some other things you might notice. You might notice your cognitive function starts to go down. Now there was a study published in JAMA that took a look at over 8,200 people over the course of three years. They found that there was strong correlation between people that had more muscle mass over age 65 and having less cognitive decline. Now, there's a number of different reasons here. There's an indirect reason and a direct reason. The sort of indirect reason implies that, well, if you have less muscle mass and you're moving less, you're essentially having less blood flow to the brain. And that makes a big difference in how our brain actually functions. So that's a more mechanical kind of indirect way. But then there's the more direct mechanistic approach. And that implies that the more muscle that you have, when you move that muscle, exercise or just walking, you have more myokines, but also what's called brain-derived nootropic factor that are circulating. These are compounds that go to the brain and they can actually help nerve growth factor. They can actually help the neurons remain strong and healthy and potentially even grow new neurons. So there's direct and indirect sort of mechanical and more metabolic reasons that muscle mass affects your brain. So if you're looking at yourself over the course of the last five years and you're like, I feel like I'm losing cognitive function a little bit, you might wanna look at how much muscle mass you have because it could play a role. More than likely, the same metabolic effects that are making you lose muscle are the same metabolic effects that are affecting your brain too though. So a lot of times it's a canary in a coal mine. It's not necessarily just losing muscle. It's the fact that maybe the cognitive aspect is what sort of flips the light on for you having a metabolic issue. The other thing that you might notice is start noticing you're getting sick more more illness, right? Now, a really common body of research is in an area called the glutamine pool. Okay, we look at the glutamine pool because glutamine is an amino acid that breaks down, particularly from muscle, but from proteins in general, but especially from muscle, and it fuels really fast replicating, fast eating cells like lymphocytes and monocytes, so immune cells that really fuel fast. So glutamine can fuel these. Now, the more muscle mass that you have, the more glutamine you have available. You have a larger glutamine pool. So as you start to lose muscle, you lose that glutamine pool size, which means you have less fuel for those monocytes and for those lymphocytes and the immune system in general. So you have less sort of wiggle room to be able to fight an illness. Now you might be thinking, can I just take glutamine supplements? You can, but the results are kind of eh, like they're not the greatest. We don't really know for sure if it's doing much at all. And in some studies, we've even seen that adding glutamine into the mix can actually hinder your body's ability to sort of produce it naturally and break it down naturally. So you really wanna have that muscle mass on you to protect you from illness, not just in the sense of muscle wasting, but in the sense of actually providing glutamine for those immune cells. Additionally, the muscle can produce interleukin-6 and interleukin-8, which may sound bad, but sometimes those interleukins, those cytokines, can be pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. So the more muscle that we have, when we can produce this IL-6 and IL-8, that can have an immunomodulatory effect and actually suppress inflammation a little bit more. So all of these things come together. But what about some simple mechanical things you might notice? You might notice your balance isn't as good. Now, this is simple because you have lots of little muscles that help stabilize. And when you start to atrophy, especially if you've been inactive, a lot of times you lose those muscles quickly. 
right? Because you're not using them. You're not using those stabilizing muscles. You might still be using your big muscles and your stabilizing muscles to a degree, but not like when you're exercising. So one of the first things people start to notice is they're like, well, maybe I'm still strong in a linear fashion, but my balance is off or I feel a little wonky here. That's a very good sign that that's where you're starting to break down. You just gotta be aware of it. Also respiratory function. There are a lot of muscles that interact with our respiratory function, our ability to breathe. So if you find that it's getting harder to get a breath, there's a number of different things that could be going on. Obviously your cardiorespiratory fitness could be suffering, but you also could be simply dealing with a muscular issue, right? You're not able to lift the rib cage the same way. You're not able to have those muscles that are working to help your lungs, help you breathe. So if you found yourself getting tired doing just regular household chores, things like that, you gotta pay attention to that. So here's a few things that you can do to prevent the muscle breakdown, even if you're not resistance training. But before I get into that, the number one thing you can do is resistance train. So do that, keep load on the muscles, keep stimulus. The best thing you can do is move throughout the day. You don't need to be resistance training, okay? I would prefer if you do, but move throughout the day is going to be number one. If you don't use it, you lose it. Okay, we become sedentary, we start losing that muscle. Moving the muscle, just taking little walks, doing that is much more muscle sparing and much more anti-catabolic than people give it credit for. Not to mention 10 minute walks after you eat, soaking up the glucose so you're not falling victim to the insulin resistance that can contribute to muscle protein breakdown. Protein throughout the day. Okay, start your day with a high amount of protein so you're making a concerted effort then so you don't have to stress about it quite as much throughout the rest of the day. If you start your morning with a small amount of protein, you run the risk of not getting the protein throughout the rest of the day. Start out right and the rest of the day will follow. Okay, if you need to have a protein shake, don't be afraid of it. It's okay to have a whey protein shake. It's okay to have a collagen protein shake. It's okay to have a plant-based protein shake. Don't be afraid of that stuff because keeping the muscle on you is probably a better thing than worrying about one particular ingredient in one scoop of protein powder that could be what actually allows you to keep the muscle on, which we have much more data on. So let's be focusing on that more than the little nitty gritty stuff. Another thing you can do is sip on essential amino acids. Now, technically it would break a fast because of the leucine. So if you're a faster, you don't wanna do it while you're fasting. But sipping on essential amino acids might not be a bad thing throughout the course of the day. But additionally, having essential amino acids, EAAs, along with protein meals can help make the protein more available and potentially allow you to synthesize more of the protein from the meal. There's even some studies that demonstrate up to 4X increase in protein synthesis from a meal when essential amino acids are taken along with that meal. As far as your workouts are concerned, try to focus a little bit more on time under tension. Okay, I don't want you to focus on just doing mechanically heavy loads all the time. Focus on how long the muscle is under load. So if you're doing bicep curls, focus on how long is this muscle being contracted. Don't go ridiculously slow, but try to get a metabolic effect from your workouts. Everyone goes into a workout thinking, how much can I lift, mechanical, move this. Focus more on metabolic. Go for a pump. Try to get as much blood into the muscle as you can so you can help encourage the glucose uptake into the muscle to help the whole insulin resistance piece. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. See you tomorrow.